Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday evening Bible broadcast. Tonight we're going to be looking at Victorious Believers, the Attack on Children. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I pray now that you will give us guidance, help, and instruction. May your Holy Spirit be our great teacher. As we go through this material tonight, Father, I pray that we will be awakened and that we will be aware of what is taking place around us. Not to be afraid, but to win. Help us to be winners. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are looking at the attack on children. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at the attack that is being imposed upon our culture. And we've looked at the attack on the Bible and the attack on manhood and womanhood. Uh, tonight, we're looking at children. And next week, we're looking at the attack on the church. In this session, we're going to be looking at the attack on children. I recently read this quote. The children now love luxury, they have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for elders, and love chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up dainties at the table, and cross their legs and tyrannize their teachers. Wow, that could be any school or any group of kids that we know today. However, this quote was taken from Socrates. Socrates lived from 470 to 399 BC. He was the guy that was ordered to death by an Athenian court on the charges of impiety. That means disrespect for the sacred and corruption, dishonest and fraudulent conduct of the young. In other words, they were charging him with corrupting the young people of his culture. And this is what he had to say about the young people of his culture. Uh, I think this charge could almost be um, leveled against any of us tonight. Um, he was the guy that was sentenced to death and then required to carry out his own execution by consuming a potion of poison hemlock. Now, I want you to think about it. Who would we blame in America for the failings that we see? Are our children worse than previous generations? Let's look at some of the issues faced by children today, not faced by previous generations. So we have the social media. There's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, Reddit, Dig, Quora, Clubhouse, Flickr, Photobucket, Pinterest, WhatsApp app. I was working very diligently the other day and I received a phone call from a friend of mine that is a missionary um, doing work in India. And she said, Pastor, I can't find your name on WhatsApp app. And I said, oh, I, I don't use WhatsApp app. Well, I have some things I need to send you. And so I took like a, an hour out of my day to set up the WhatsApp app on my cell phone so that she could send me some things um, that she wanted me to be aware of and to pray about. Um, there's been terrible storms in India, floods. Um, they're feeding people. That's That was some of the things she wanted me to see. But it was not something that I was used to. I don't use Twitter. I don't use Instagram. I was part of LinkedIn, but they made it so complicated to get back into LinkedIn. If it required another password, I just gave up. I don't do TikTok, I don't do Reddit, I don't do any of these things. But I want you to know that there are people that have all of these things plus on their phones. When you Google social media, 
and start going there's pages and pages and pages of things that i have never heard of and will probably never use and so we have the internet with its constant flow of information there's personal communication which i think really lacks today I'm one of these guys, I would still rather receive a phone call than a text message. I have people that send me text messages and they want these lengthy answers in a text message. I just don't have the time. And, and I'm getting to the point where I tell them, look, I will answer this when I can, you know, give it some time. I, I'll type it out and send you a message, but I just don't have time to text a long answer. And it's gotten to the point where people no longer disagree with each other. They have to destroy the opponent. Now, before um, coming to class tonight, I was just reading through some of the um, news of the day. And um, I, his name was right on the tip of my tongue, but I've forgotten it. But the guy who has just won um, the speakership of the House, um, they're talking about having a vote to oust him out of the speakership, McCarthy, um, to, to, to oust him out of the speakership of the House because they don't like the way he has handled um, certain things concerning um, the restructuring of our national debt, which, by the way, nobody has ever gone hungry. They've always gotten their pay. It might have been late, but, um, you know, most of us have never, ever missed anything when the government shut down. So personal communication, and that leads to isolation. Um, isolationism is a big thing today uh, because a lot of people have gotten to the point that they want communication without confrontation. And so if it, uh, Rita's sitting in the other room right now listening to everything that I have to say, if it requires any kind of confrontation at all, I have to handle it. Um, she will not handle it because she just hates that sort of thing. I can understand that with her, but as as when you're younger, there's going to be confrontation all the time on the job. If you're in education, um, you know, husbands, wives, everybody is going to have some sort of confrontation, and and people just don't want to handle that anymore. And so um, I want to focus tonight on the idea of personal communication. So I have selected three um, illustrations of things that are taking place um, uh, in our world that require personal communication. So before I get started, I just want to tell a personal story. So in my generation, and most of you who are listening to me tonight are from my generation. You are uh, baby boomers or maybe just a little bit older than baby boomers. But in our generation, we were taught that communication would include people that agree and disagree with us. Now, I only ran for a political office once in my life. And when we lived in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, our daughter Erin was in the sixth grade. And while she was in the sixth grade, we were informed that a sex education program was introduced under health curriculum um, in, in the middle school where she was attending. Uh, when a group of parents asked to view the curriculum, uh, we were told that it was not open for review. The outcome was awful. There were meetings with the school board. There were meetings with teachers. There was meetings with the administration from the middle school there were meetings with the school board and the administration of the middle school and teachers of the middle school we had teachers from the middle school in our church and 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 uh, we lost a couple of families um through this but it was uh, it was really important i felt that it was as a parent 
I felt it was really important that this be handled and taken care of uh, because um, with this um, healthcare curriculum, there was a video and the video opened up with a person sitting on a swing set and um, looking at the camera swinging and then got off the swing and the narrator came on and said, um, the person that you just saw uh, in this video is a homosexual. And as you can tell, there's no difference between a homosexual or anybody else. That was the way they opened this sex education course. So you can imagine where it went from there. And when, when I went to the president of the school board and talked to him about it, he says, well, that can't be because um, we review all of the curriculum. And I said to him, Paul, you haven't viewed this curriculum. Nobody has seen it. They won't even show it to the parents. Well, that can't be. Well, and it was. And when the, when the school board got a hold of it, they handled it. They handled it properly. But the outcome was, was that the administration at the middle school, although they didn't fire them, they got their hands slapped very thoroughly. Well, we were starting to get, um, you know, Aaron would come home from school and Rita would say, how's it going in school today, Aaron? Well, Mr. So-and-so, who happened to be the principal of the middle school, well, you know, how often does the principal of a school have anything to do with an individual child. But he was saying things to Aaron, things were happening to Aaron, and we finally had to just take her out of the school. And um, there was a church school that was in the area. They actually heard what was taking place, and, and they called me up and they said, you know, we would like to have your child come to our school. They gave us a discount. I'm I have to admit that. But the outcome of the whole thing was was that you know we ended up not only paying taxes on the house that we lived in for the public school, but we also paid for the tuition for Aaron to go to a private school. And I was very, very upset about some things that were taking place. Well, this parental group talked me into running for the school board. By the way, I lost. And there were some things taking place during the election that were just very discouraging. I sat down with a businessman in town in Thief River Falls, and, and um, I, I could speak very openly to him. And he said, well, Dan, he says, uh, I, I have one suggestion for you. He says, don't burn bridges. You know, people that disagree on one subject might be your greatest supporter on another. Learn to communicate without compromise. And um, that was a wonderful piece of advice. I didn't compromise. I did lose um, the election. But through that, there were some people that decided they wanted to take a better look at our church. And as in the long run, there were some people that got saved and because I wouldn't compromise. I want you to remember this. Even Paul said that he used the good things of Rome to spread the gospel. Now, uh, on Wednesday nights, I'm teaching the book of Romans. And there were people um, in the culture that Paul was ministering to that was wondering if there could ever be a Christian in Rome because of the debauchery that was taking place in Rome. When we take a look at Rome as a society, it, it was a debauched culture. It was a terrible culture. I would venture to say that to be a Christian in Rome required um, uh, would have would have re would have required for you to put up with things that were probably a little, even a little more evil right now than what we're facing um, on an everyday basis. So um, we have we have a ways to go.
to dip as low as Rome and even Greece. But I, I'm convinced that America is on her way. So communicate without compromise. In the end, the school issue cost us something. I want to repeat this because I'm convinced that when we stand up to things, it's going to cost us something. There are going to be people who are going to criticize us. They're going to stand in our face. Um, but I'm, I'm convinced that God will give us um, courage and he will give us uh, what it's going to take and the understanding that it's going to take. Remember, Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to say when you're brought before magistrates and kings. For in that day, the spirit will fill your mouth. And this is something that we're going to be looking at over the next few Sunday nights is discernment, the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit more than ever before. And so I just want you to be aware of what is taking place. I believe it is possible to stand up to culture and not compromise. If I didn't believe that we can become victorious, I would not be teaching this course. I want you to know right now that I'm not going to send you home like a whipped puppy with your tail between your legs, wondering what am I going to do next. We're not going to be standing in the corner, rubbing our hands back and forth in fear. I'm convinced that we're going to have our eyes open and we're going to see things. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to become conquerors. In fact, more than conquerors. I want you just to say that right now in your home, wherever you are, we are more than conquerors. I am more than a conqueror. So I need to ask the question, does the Bible speak to the problems of our culture? And I'm going to say yes. I have selected three illustrations um, from our culture that uh, I believe when, when you see it and when you begin to see it in scripture it's going to put a new light on things so in our last session we learned that transculturalism leads to instability destruction of society and identity and i encourage you to go listen to the video from last week on the attack on manhood and womanhood and even if you went through the course, I encourage you to listen to it again and just to look at, refresh yourself with those notes on pages 12 and 13. So I'm going to talk, first of all, about teen gangs. What does the Bible have to say about teen gangs? A lot of people think that the Bible is quiet on this subject. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. According to functional family therapy, many teens join gangs because they're looking for a sense of belonging. There's that transculturalism, uh, a society that is ruined, and a society where people don't feel like they belong, a society where there's no camaraderie, and they're looking for protection as well as immediate sources of gratification like money or thrills. Unfortunately, the short and long-term negative consequences are often profound. Such things as arrest, incarceration, injury, even death. So, what does the Bible say about gang involvement? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 2, we have the account of Elijah anointing Elisha to succeed him as the prophet to Israel. If you're in your Bibles, you can drop down to verses 23 and 24. Elisha has left Jericho and is in Bethel. Bethel is the house of God. You'd think a city called the house of God 
would be a place of comfort and rest and peace. But this is what we read. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. Then he went up from there to Bethel. As he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. So he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled. 42 of the youths. Now, you may be familiar with this account. You may not be. But you'd have to ask the question, why would two female bears maul 42 youths? Well, Gleason Archer, who is uh, a, a biblical historian, archaeologist, puts everything into perspective when he describes this large roving band of teenagers as a serious public danger quite as grave as the large youth gangs that roam the ghetto sections of our modern american cities the apologetic study bible explains the hebrew phrase for small boys refers to adolescents from 12 to 30 years old. See 1 Samuel 20, 35 and 1 Kings 3, 7 and 11 through 17. Now, I am taking this quote from Gleason Archer. I would add, if I was doing this, I would add another reference and that would be the reference where Abraham takes Isaac up Mount Moriah um, to become the sacrifice because Isaac is called a youth. But that particular um, Hebrew word for youth is the same that's used here in Samuel 2035, which would make Isaac up to age 30, which would be a perfect illustration because if Isaac is going to be a picture of Christ. Christ was age 30 when he started his journey toward the cross. And so Isaac and Jesus would have been young men, um, youths. That would be the Hebrew term for it. So it's unlikely that these youths were younger than 12 years old. Uh, contrary to the character, Elisha was a young man probably in his mid-20s. So we have um, a clash here in the culture. You have a prophet, a new prophet, that's probably in his 20s, and you have a gang of 42. The youngest would probably be 12, the oldest in their 30s, or just 30. So Elisha, it's obvious that he's bald. So the real issue is not how this gang showed contempt and disrespect for God's prophet, but revealed utter disrespect for the Lord. Therefore, a strong message was sent to the city and the parents. Now, if you'll remember in Leviticus 26, uh, chapter 26, verses 21 through 22, rebellious sons were to be stoned. And so here were rebellious sons in the city of the house of God. So this scripture is given to us to show us, uh, and, and, and I want to be careful here because I know that every person is accountable and responsible for they, their own activities. But in this case, God is speaking to the city of Bethel, particularly to the parents of the city, and he's saying, hey, you need to get some things into order here because this was a warning that if the city didn't get things straightened out, there was going to be a greater 
discipline or judgment from God that was going to be paid. So this scripture tells how hostility toward God and an un unwillingness to obey him can result in being besieged by plagues and wild animals. The message was a corrective message to address her tattoos and behavior that if heeded would ward off worse sins and greater judgment. So the gang was shocked and silenced when mauled. Now remember, it's the scripture says they were mauled and they weren't killed. So there may have been some killed, we don't know, but that they weren't necessarily killed, they were mauled by the bears. And their parents and community were warned to repent of their sins, which is reflected in their children. See, the sins of the parents are reflected in the children. So the sins of our society and its rebelling to the word of God and to the house of God and the things of God are going to be reflected in the children of the society. And obey God before worse judgments befall them. Walter C. Kaiser writes how the eventual fall of Israel would have been avoided had the people repented after their attack. They did not. According to Second Chronicles 36, 16, we read how they kept ridiculing God's messengers, despising his words, and scoffing at his prophets. As Kaiser wisely states, the bear attack shows God trying, hiddenly, bringing people back to himself through smaller judgments so that they could avoid a worse full force judgment. There we have God dealing with a society because of their rebellion and the gang problem that comes about because of the rebellion of the society. All right. I want to talk about role-playing games for just a moment, RPGs and video games. So I want you to pretend with me for just a little bit. You're a wizard, accompanying a team of adventurers on a quest to find an ancient treasure hidden somewhere in a deep work of paths and dungeons. Your motive isn't greed. The treasure is the only hope of rescuing a poverty-stricken village from a pandemic and teetering on the brink of starvation. Without the proceeds from this treasure to buy desperately needed food, medicine, and supplies, hundreds of villagers will die. As your party ventures deeper into the grim caverns, you begin to wonder if you'll ever see home again. Suddenly, you hear shouts. You hear an unearthly growl, and the ground beneath you begins to shake. As you turn the corner, the sight before you sends a shiver down your spine. There are no words to describe the ghastly monster that you now see. As it lumbers toward you, one thing is clear. It plans to kill you and your entire party. Thankfully. You have the magical powers to spare. You raise your staff to freeze the monster in a cone of ice. But then you remember, I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to use magic. What am I doing? The scenario described above is similar to an encounter you're likely to experience if you play a fantasy role-playing game referred to nowadays as RPGs, like Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, or a host of other possibilities. And by the way, these aren't all in video. There are card games today that children play where they are trading cards. And um, it's been a real eye opener to read some of these cards and to see what these cards represent. Uh, it is right out of the gods of Greek mythology, the Romans, 
the stuff that we thought was dead and gone. And I'm convinced it's just demonic activity rewrapped. So what does the Bible say about role playing? I'm going to have to stop right here and say this. I believe this is one area in which there needs to be discernment. I am not going to um, tell you that you have to take care of all of the video games out of your house. And, um, you know, I don't know all the games that are out there. So please, I am asking that you begin to discern certain things. And, and I think as we go through some scriptures, some things are going to be real, and it's going to be obvious that there are certain games that Christians need to be aware of, and I believe they need to um, delete from their repertoire of games and get out of their lives. In Proverbs 15, verses 21 through 22, the scripture says, Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Philippians 1, 9 through 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and un all uncleanness or covetousness let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talk nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Are role-playing games sinful? When I was a child, we did role-playing every Christmas during the Christmas program. And, and that's one of the arguments that I hear come up all the time. Well, what about this or what about that? Well, folks, I'm convinced that role playing is something that has gotten out of hand. Um, we're coming upon Halloween. And, and I have here in my desk a... Um, um, copy of a radio broadcast that James Dobson did with a man who brought a chieftain from an island nation to the United States. They started walking through a large department store and looking at all the masks. And this chieftain started pointing at pointing at various masks and and he was saying Oh, that's that God, and that's that God, and that's another God. And, you know, we dress up our little kids as, as demons, as witches, warlocks, 
and we send them out trick-or-treating and we laugh and we smile at them. And I'm convinced that that is the number one tool that the devil uses to break down authority in our lives. If he can get us to make sinful things humorous, I believe that he's won a great victory. Did I go trick-or-treating as a child? Yes. Did I dress up as a child? Yes. I remember one time I dressed up like a lady. I put on an old cotton dress that my mother had. I put on some hose that she, I took them out of the garbage because my mom had thrown them away. They had big holes in them. And I thought that was funny, a lady with holes in her nylons. So I, I put on this dress. I had nylons with holes. I had some shoes with heels. I put on an old mop head for my hair and then tied a um, hanky, I don't know what you call those, um, a scarf around that. And I went trick-or-treating like that. Would I do it today? When I was a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I realized today how dangerous that can be. I didn't have an identity problem with, am I a boy or a girl? I had no identity problems with that. I knew that I was a boy. But if you dressed up a child who might be having issues with that, what are you doing? And I think these are the sort of things that before we do them, we need to make it a matter of prayer. One of the gifts of the Spirit is the discerning of Spirit. And I'm convinced that that is one of the gifts. Growing up in a Pentecostal church, I watched so many people spend so much time praying for tongues, speaking of the tongues, that they totally denied the other gifts of the Spirit. And, and so tonight, I encourage you to begin to practice. Pray. Ask God, what about this? What, what are we doing here? And is this going to have, what sort of an impact is this going to have on my children or on my grandchildren? Let's look at it this way. Sin starts in the mind and becomes sin as it is acted out. The fantasy of committing adultery with a woman is considered as the very act of adultery, according to Jesus. Matthew 5.28 says, For he says, But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So we must ask, does this game lead to the fantasy of sexual sins? And I need to ask this question too. Are we watching things on television that bring sin into our homes? And what does it do to our minds? Now, I can speak as a man. And I know that as a man, that, that the fantasy of the mind is something that has to be destroyed. And it's not always easy to be gotten rid of. So when we are role playing, what sort of fantasies are taking place in our minds? Jesus says in Matthew 15, 19 through 20, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, um, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Do any of these things that defile come from playing this game? Well, what's going on here? Am I being defiled in any way by playing this game? The Bible says we are to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalt, exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, 
going back to that role playing that I was talking about, and and you're going to save these people from this pandemic. Are you going to save them with the power of God, or are you going to save them with magic? What does the Bible tell us about magic? You see, I think we have to start looking at these things, and those, believe me, folks, are imaginations. When we start relying on something else to do what God says he's already done, we have an imagination that gets built up. That's the problem with gambling. If people could just play cards for the sake of playing cards and it's a game, you know, that's no problem. But people start gambling with it and they start looking at gambling as a way to increase their income, to bring them wealth. What does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't say that we do those things through gambling. The Bible talks about by faith. So those are imaginations that need to be cast down. I want you to look at this. The root word in entertainment is enter. The enemy gains entry through entertainment. Be mindful of what you are entertained by. It just may gain entry into your soul. And this is a quote by George Burt. Now, we're going to come to a sensitive issue. This really bothered Rita when she read it, but and and I and I and I and I really prayed, do I add this in? But I when 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 I pastored in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, there were two ladies that were convinced that at night the Holy Spirit was coming and laying with them in their beds. And as a young pastor, I I I I assured them it was not the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know what it was. There was a cartoon series called South Park. I don't know if it's still on or not. I know that they have reruns of it. And different friends of mine had talked about it. So I decided one evening I would turn on South Park and I would listen to it. I listened to it for just a little bit because I realized that what they were talking about was demonic. And they used some terms that I wasn't familiar with. So I went on a little investigation to find out what they were talking about. So this is taken from the actual transcript. You can find it online. It's called The Succubus. And it's the third episode of season three and the 34th episode, overall episode of South Park. This aired on April 21st, 1999. It just so happens that this is the only one of the South Park cartoons I ever watched a portion of. And I realized tonight why it made me so sick. So here's the synopsis of the transcript. There is this man by the name of Chef. Chef's parents arrive in South Park from Scotland, fresh from an encounter with the Loch Ness Monster, to attend Chef's wedding. Hartman, and I really don't know who he is, he's one of the characters, goes to the eye doctor and has to wear a huge pair of glasses. He's especially angry at the fact that the doctor constantly mocks him because of his weight. I remember that part of the cartoon. At lunchtime, Cartman shows up in front of Stan, Kyle, and Kenny, since he never misses lunch. The boys go in to get their lunch, but instead of Chef, there's a skinny white guy called Mr. Dirk, a funny but illiterate man who irritates the boys, with the exception of Cartman. After school, the boys go to Chef's house, and they discover he is engaged to a woman named Veronica. 
they discover chef has quit his job now folks i want you to understand that this cartoon is making fun of religion the whole way through it if any of you are familiar with catholicism and the stations of the cross one of the stations of the cross is uh, uh replicates the time that jesus fell on his face and a woman by the name of veronica came with a towel and wiped the blood off from jesus and when she opened up the towel as he continued on his way his face showed on the towel that's one of the stations of the cross so this is a direct assault on catholicism they discover chef has quit his job and has become an overall duller and lamer of a person to them veronica even plays a hypnotic song for the boys which they all hate after class the boys ask mr garrison for advice he tells them that the woman is probably a succubus a female demon sent from hell to suck the to suck the life out of men and that she just screws with them and leaves them the boys tell garrison that he is quite good um he he is quite good at advice but he's happy to hear mr hat tells him isn't fooling anybody by pretending to like women heavily implying that he is gay so now you have attacks on the church you have attacks on sexuality you have demonic activity this is all wrapped up in a cartoon the boys go to tell chef that veronica is a succubus hartman is then dragged away by his mom to go for his laser corrective surgery veronica comes to see him and shows him that she baked him a pie Stan, Kyle, and Kenny say they know what she is, but Veronica convinces them that she's not a monster. However, her face suddenly transforms into that of a demon, and she says in a demonic voice they cannot stop her from marrying Shep the next day before leaving. Terrified, the boys realize they have to stop Veronica at all costs. At the party before the wedding, the boys tell everyone that Veronica is a succubus, a demon, which makes her cry. Jeff chases the boys out angrily. The boys stay up all night researching the succubus and how to stop her. This is like vampire slain. They discover that to stop her, they must sing her song backwards. Now, for those of you who've ever studied um the music world the entertainment world um playing a song backwards is called backwards masking and it is a proven fact that there are often times subliminal messages that are recorded into songs that one when, when they are played backwards you hear what they honestly have to say oftentimes these songs particularly if they are from um a heavy metal rock band a rock band that is into drug use um they will talk about um sex drug use um they'll have the sounds of demons uh, there's all sorts of nastiness that takes place in this so this is actually teaching children to listen to this backwards masking so that they get into this sort of thing at the wedding during the vows they tell cartman to play the tape of the song's music backwards but it is delayed because cartman dozes off from the lack of sleep veronica transforms into her demonic form and begins to fly around and destroy the church scaring off most of the attendees unfortunately cartman's tape recorder jams and when kenny tries to fix it the succubus jumps on kenny crushing him to death fortunately the tape resumes and the boys finish the song 
defeating the succubus and sending her back to the depths of hell. All right. So there are two demonic forms that the occult world recognizes. One is called the incubus. The other is called the succubus. But they are both evil spirits that lay on top of an individual during sleep, especially having sexual intercourse with that ind individual while they're sleeping. They are spirits that oppress or burden a person like a nightmare. So these things continue with them. With these two ladies that I was dealing with in, Th in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, they kept talking about the burden and they kept talking about how um, this spirit would stay with them throughout the day and they could feel this spirit. Now, again, they thought it was the Holy Spirit so they thought they were given special power by the Holy Spirit. And they were talking about doing some things. Actually, this one lady talked about someone had done something against her. And so she said, Spirit, I want you to go and I want you to tweak this person. And this particular person had a spill um and hurt themselves and uh, she used this i don't know how many times but she said at various times i would send this spirit out so i'm telling you i have firsthand information firsthand insight into some of these things and i did not know at the time what i was dealing with so and these are things that I have learned since. So they are spirits that oppress, they burden, they go with people. The incubus attacks females while the succubus attacks males. These spirits operate through witchcraft, spells, sexual sin, perversion, and curses of lust, what the Bible calls whoredom. They are filthy spirits causing lust dreams followed by tormenting the individual with guilt and condemnation. That's why the Bible is so, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And the breaking of guilt, how does the devil keep God's people um, condemned through guilt? These demons are found in the Bible, in Chemosh, um, a city in 1 Kings 11, uh, verses 7 and 33, demon god of the Moabites, whose name means subduer, depressor, vanquisher, and incubus, concealed, yearning fire, a hearth. You can find this when you look up these demon gods. Moab and Ammon were born of incest between Lot and his daughters. Genesis 19, 30 through 38. Break the curses of Moab and Ammon, perversion, incest, and whoredom, and command the spirit of Chemish and other related spirits to come out. Now, this is a direct quote from John Eckert's manual on deliverance and spiritual warfare. And uh, on page 39. And so this Mr. John Eckert talks about these demons, the reality of them. And I'm like, Rita, I'm just sick. I'm sickened by this. I remember one time a good friend of mine was talking about South Park. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, well, it's a cartoon. And I was asking him about it. And he said, really, Pastor, you don't want to know anything about this. Now I'm concerned for my friend. What was he into that he didn't want me to investigate it? Because he knew that I was going to confront him on it. And I was going to talk to him about it. So where are we going to end with this? Well, I have given you a number of scriptures that I believe are important that we pray over our children. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, Hear, O Israel, 
the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength. Psalm 20, verses 4 through 5. May he give you the desire of your heart. Make all your plans succeed. May he shout over, uh, shout for you over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Psalm 27, 13 through 14. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Isaiah 49, 25, but thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. When I, when I pray this one, I think of Paul's words of having done all to stand, stand fast, therefore the liberty with which Christ has made you free. For I will contend with him. Folks, there are forces out there that you and I cannot deliver ourselves from and deliver our children from. Only God can do that. And I believe that he will. Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Jeremiah 29, 11, 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Hallelujah. But in order that the world might be saved through him. In 2 Timothy 1.12, But thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. Jesus Christ tonight wants to contend on our behalf with the enemy of our souls, and he wants to save our children. I encourage you tonight, allow him to do that. Pray for discernment. Ask God for direction. And he will direct your paths. Father, I thank you right now for the opportunity that you have given us to come here this evening and to study your word. I pray now tonight that as we contemplate your word, you will deliver us and keep our minds healthy and free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.